phase program is a continuation of what we have been doing for the past two years in different different uh, locations. We started with China and then we also went into uh, Korea as well as in Bhopal last year. Last program last year. is a continuation of what we have. Yeah. In, please. Oh. 2019 also. Now, thanks to the with uh, University of uh, Cologne, Bonn, as well as with uh, Delft and also with Skiff Otter, we are able to continue with that thanks to their collaboration. I mean, they were in a very distinct on different aspect of it. So for the past two days, uh, next two days, we are going to start off with uh, almost like 25 experts are going to participate. So this is the first plenary session in which we are discussing something on peri-urban transformation, how it is happening in India, and uh, all the experts who are there, both uh, from abroad as well as from here, most of them are working on India, both in terms of land as well as on water and uh, infrastructure as well. So we start off with this uh, peri-urban transformation, the first one. The second, there are two parallel sessions. One is on uh, water um, with uh, chief guest as uh, Mr. Madhivanan from Orissa, so principal secretary there. And also we have Sucharita on um, gender issue. And then tomorrow we are going to have with the Dr. Uh, Sudhir Krishna, the ex-secretary of uh, MUVA previously, and also with uh, Mr. G. Bhattanaban, who was from UNDP, and uh, they, he will be focusing on disaster. Okay, so this, and apart from that, at the end of it, we have something on pathways in terms of transforming peri-urban futures. Now for this session today, peri-urban transformation, we are very, very happy to welcome Dr. Surendra Bagda, Bagde, sorry, sir who is an additional secretary at uh, MUVA, that is uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, who started off, I mean, it's as an IAS uh, carer in 1993. And uh, yes, he kept himself initially as a bachelor in electronics, but is thorough in terms of applied economics. He did his PhD from uh, Carnegie Mellon from Penn, USA. Now, apart from that, he is handling is so special in terms of SDGs in the case of uh, India and it very particularly on SDG 11 and how it is being applied here and linking it with that of SDG 6 and also in other aspects of it. And he has been handling most of the issues in terms of urban development in various government programs of the government of India. And uh, prior to that, he was in Mumbai city. So he's exposed to the different aspects, the dimensions of urban development and not only with the urban, but in Maharashtra, he has been associated with rural development as well, and also with the government of India as finance uh, director before. So, and in addition to that, he has been working, he has published quite a lot in leading journals from US, in leading journals in economics, econometrics, and is thorough in terms of statistics. And it's a really, we are fortunate to get him as a uh, you know, chief person for this particular plan, uh, peri-urban transformation for the plenary session. Apart from that, we have uh, almost like uh, five people who are experts here. Dr. Rumi Aizaz. Rumi has uh, probably as the initial thing, but I will introduce each one of them. Rumi Aizaz is from ORF and uh, Dr. Shiraz Vaja is from uh, which is that uh, Gorakhpur action group from the Dr. Boneshwar Ra, Ram is from uh, Jindal University, Dr. Karsten from University of Bonn, and Dr. Uh, Leon is from Delft. So we start off with uh, Dr. Surendra Kumar Bhagda, who is uh, additional secretary and also an expert in the field of urban development and also in terms of rural development in the future and very good in terms of economic and econometrics very particularly to SDGs. Over to Dr. Surendra Bhagda. Uh, good afternoon, uh, all the participants. Uh, Professor Sridhar has been quite... Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I think Professor Sridhar has been quite generous with my introduction. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, like uh, he has said more than what uh, is required to be said, but uh, okay. 
uh, basically this is the first time uh, i think i am attending a conference on peri urban areas and uh, you know like uh, uh, one has uh, seen the development of peri urban areas uh, when one was in uh, state and cities like mumbai but i am very happy that uh, spa bhopal is organizing a focus conference on peri urban uh, areas and their development i think the themes of water gender and uh, uh governance disaster management are going to uh, figure prominently in the discussion and as we know like in uh, urban areas uh, let me first clarify i am no expert on urban development i am here to learn and see what we can you know learn for uh, development uh, uh, as development happens in our peri urban area and how uh, the development can be uh, not guided uh, but see what we can do to make sure that Uh, the development benefits uh, the citizens who are living in that area uh, to the maximum extent possible and i think uh, that's a focus in terms of what learning values we can derive uh, through this conference so uh, as having said that so i think i would be very brief in uh, my comments and so i think we know that Uh, the core of cities whichever cities you take be it mumbai delhi or any other city has remained uh, static whereas the urban growth which has happened in any city uh, be in the us be in india and all that it has expanded beyond those core cities and uh, like if you go to a core of the city like say uh, 100 years back then you will see like Uh, the core is maybe you're not one tenth or one uh, fifth of uh, city, as uh, you know, like uh, what you see as the city in today. So the growth has expanded uh, because the development took place in peri-urban areas. But in recent times, we have seen that it's not only uh, peri-urban areas which um, uh, have grown, but also a bigger regional areas like uh, what we call metropolitan areas. Uh, they have been the source of growth. of urban population in all our metro cities we see that the core then there is a you know surrounding area whatever you call it peri urban and then there is a metropolitan area which is um, which are many small towns and many cities they are supporting the growth of city and peri urban area so i think uh, that is what uh, is happening uh, but at the same time the facilities and amenities and i think they differ remarkably uh in peri urban and those regional areas and compared to the city center uh, uh, you know uh, the core of the cities uh, area so this differences in uh, amenities are there and uh, government as well as the city governments uh, you know they are trying to bridge those differences and raise the level of uh, uh, those amenities there so that uh, citizens have uh, access to uh, good amenities in those areas also i think as peri urban areas and uh, regional areas have expanded they are also posing a lot of challenge uh, to the urban development and uh, the some of the challenges have been uh, listed here like uh, water security uh, you know i think uh, then uh, this uh, issues of urban governance in those areas is also very important i think the one area which is also very remarkable in terms of its uh, uh, prominence is urban transportation and uh, which i think uh, professor uh, uh, sidharan should have covered but i think in uh, whenever uh, there is an opportunity next time i think we should be discussing uh, uh, this transportation system and linking uh, those areas regional areas and peri urban areas to the city center or to each other through a, a different modes of public transportation be it trains metros buses uh, cycles you know walking all are very important and i think that focus uh, needs to be very central to the urban uh, planning and planning for this uh, areas and uh, what is happening is that uh, the development happens and then the planning for the urban transport system is happening and i think if we can have uh, the transport system design and planning to coincide with the development of those areas i think it will do a great uh, good for those citizens who are commuting long distances from those areas for work into the city center so i think 
that uh, if that can be deliberated i think there can be some learning values and we can see some experiences uh, acts and learning from some cities which we can implement in our uh, uh, cities in the country i think uh, the conference is uh, uh, going to be very interesting i would uh, very keenly time to see what we can learn from uh, this conference and uh, and uh, i think professor sridharan has uh, when we had a conference in bangalore uh, on uh, sdgs uh, you know like um, it was very evident that there is a large role for this planning and development of these areas to achieve sdg by 2030 in our urban areas similarly uh, uh, the focus on uh, you know uh, these issues if they are uh, managed properly and uh, uh, you know like uh, development happens properly then the then the achievement of sdg will be facilitated and i think we will be on the right track to achieve those goals so uh, i wish uh, the conference uh, great success i am very happy that participants from different walks of life and from different institutions are there i have seen uh, you know quite uh, many join online and uh, one only wishes that it could have been done offline and where i think uh, learning through interaction you know personal interaction is uh, much more valuable and uh, the network which one forms is also uh, of a longer duration and deeper uh, but nonetheless i think this should be taken as a beginning uh, and uh, whatever uh, uh, the people who are involved in this conference it i think uh, we should follow it up uh, subsequently also uh, this should not be seen as uh, you know like uh, the beginning and the end rather this can be seen at the beginning of a discussion and let us uh, let us come out with some concrete action plan uh, wherein we can see okay we know how our peri urban areas and uh, regional areas are developing can there be some you know few lessons i would not say like too many but uh, i always think that say top five lessons and then you can have next five and all that but okay let's let's focus on top five lessons which and then let's see how uh, those lessons and those practices and those experiences, uh, how they can be integrated into the planning and development which is happening currently in our country. And I think uh, if that we can identify and also the pathways of getting those aspects integrated into our planning, governance and development uh, issues, I think uh, that would be of great uh, help uh, to us um, in the country. And with that, I would like to end here. I wish all the participants uh, great health and to take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That's a very good point, which you talked about the core city versus the peri-urban area and also the uh, issues in terms of infrastructure and within the infrastructure specifically about the transport. Yes, sir, we tried to cover that in, the, in terms of infrastructure. In terms of governance, how we can do that in terms of mobility and other aspects, we'll try to do that, sir, definitely. And um, thank you very much for sharing your time and also to, to point out some of the things in terms of how to come out with in terms of action plan and uh, at least a few lessons which we can try to do that. Okay, I'm really thankful to you for this uh, particular thing. Now we go to uh, Dr. Rumi Azars. Rumi Azaz is working as a senior fellow at uh, ORF for the Observer Research Foundation. He has um, a PhD and in the field of regional planning. And he has also worked with the LSC as a postdoctoral visiting fellow in the London School of Economics. And he's the person behind in setting up in terms of urban policy research program at ORF. And he has published quite a lot in the field of uh, urban governance, urban development, and a recent one which he has done in the World Urban Forum is on regional planning for sustainable land use, which talks about the different dimensions of peri-urban as well as urban and as well as rural area, which he published in uh, 2020. Uh, without taking much time, over to Dr. Rumi Azaz, please. Rumi, you're there? Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Is my voice coming? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, may I share the presentation? I have a presentation. Yeah, can you? You're, you're doing or he's? I'm, I'm doing it. Yeah, please, you go ahead. Uh, you can upload. Yeah. Okay. 
and this is visible to all yeah it's coming yes all right uh, thank you very much sir for the introduction uh, as you mentioned the title of my uh, presentation is peri urban areas of india an overview i thought it would be a good point to start with for this conference uh, the information is presented in six uh, or rather four parts in the first part an overview or an introduction to a peri urban area is given uh, in the second part it describes the uh, conditions prevailing in peri urban areas Uh, the third in the third part uh, information is provided on the government policies and reforms for peri urban areas and finally i end with some thoughts as to what should be our responses towards uh, addressing the issue of peri urban growth uh i'm trying to go to the next slide yes uh, so in this you can see a map which shows an imaginary uh, peri urban area and uh, uh, am i audible yes sir okay in this map you can see in the center an imaginary urban area uh, and uh, this area is surrounded by different types of peri urban areas uh, as the term indicates uh, peri urban area is an area which is at the periphery of an urban area or a city and india's uh, in india's uh, peri urban areas uh, different forms of settlement structures can be found uh, for example hamlets are there villages are there census towns are there slums are there then unauthorized colonies are there and even uh, now days what we are seeing is increasing coming up or growth of planned housing and township projects in peri urban areas uh, so these peri urban areas are undergoing a transformation uh, this is observed from the increasing population densities uh, changes in land use and occupational patterns and the growth of built structures this can include residential uh, areas uh, or uh, in industries industrial units or institutional areas and commercial shops etc so uh, these changes are happening because of the in migration of population those people who are unable to uh, bear the cost of living uh, in the city or uh, who do not find a house in the city because of non availability of affordable houses they have no option but to reside in uh, a peri urban area so it can be said that peri urban areas of today uh, in many cases in india uh, are inhabited by the uh, native population uh, which uh, which are basically the farmers farming community engaged in different agro based activities and also uh, uh, this is inhabited by the migrant settlers who reside here and pursue various non farm interests uh, so many people living in peri urban areas uh, benefit from the transformation uh, there is exchange of ideas and new income generating activities are uh, they they come up they are started uh, but uh, certain adversities are also visible and uh, this is what i have shown on this slide for example uh, the first uh, point uh, that can be identified is the indiscriminate conversion of land use uh, there are open spaces green areas uh, farm lands which are reducing with the upcoming of uh, built structures and non farm economic activities and these changes uh, negatively impact Uh, the living conditions and lives of uh, the native population and this is observed in peri urban areas of hubli dharwad jammu and in census towns in west bengal these cases have been documented in the literature the second issue is unregulated development uh, we observe that there is haphazard growth of built structures and many of these structures or buildings do not meet the safety norms 
Uh, also, it is noticed that very urban areas, several one of them are colonized by private developers. Uh, the, these developers, they, they, they convince villagers with attractive prices, they acquire their the agricultural land, and then they carry out illegal subdivision of that land and dispose it when land values increase. This is observed in uh, Hyderabad and Chennai, uh, where uh, the villagers lost their land to private colonizers who, who misled them in various ways. The third issue is about the emergence of informal or unplanned areas, such as slums and unauthorized colonies on the periphery of a city. Uh, these generally come up near uh, planned residential areas or work areas, uh, because uh, those people who are unable to buy a house or rent a house in the in the planned area uh, have are left with no option but to reside in a peri-urban area, and uh, that's the reason why many slums and unauthorized colonies have come up. Now, these people play an important role. Uh, by these people, I mean peri-urban residents living in such unauthorized or informal areas, they play an important role in providing valuable services, essential services to those who are living in plant colonies, such as domestic help, gardeners, car cleaners, et cetera, et cetera, plumbers. Uh, so the cases of Jaipur and Faridabad documented in the literature highlight this aspect. The fourth point is about the inferior quality of life in peri-urban areas. Uh, in view of their illegal status, they are generally unserved uh, by the or uncovered by the public delivery systems, uh, service delivery systems, such as water supply and sanitation. For this reason, many peri-urban residents extract groundwater. Uh, and this also adversely affects the requirements of the native population, uh, that is the farmers, the landless laborers, uh, the, their crops and their livestock. Uh, a related issue here is the quality of drainage in these areas. Uh, while rampant built structures are constructed, no attention is paid to provision of drainage facilities. So quite often one would find, find in, during the monsoon season uh, that uh, there is water logging. And this, these areas uh, are become the breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Uh, the fifth problem is uh, displacement of the population. Uh, at times, uh, people living in peri-urban areas, especially the informal areas, they are evicted because of a government's policy, like implementation of a regional infrastructure project, like road corridor. Now, this happened in Gur Gurugram, which is just next to Delhi. Uh, it's a neighboring city. Uh, it happened here, and the people protested against the government's policy, but eventually they were relocated because of their unauthorized occupancy of the land. And many of these people were unhappy with the uh, with their relocation to a new place. Uh, then some people or the native population has also been displaced uh, from, the, from, their, uh, from the peri urban area because of the coming up of a township project. This too happened in Guru, Gurugram. The fifth and final uh, point on this slide is about weak mobility and connectivity. Now, since these areas are situated at the periphery of uh, an urban area uh, or a city, therefore they remain uncovered properly by public transportation systems. Uh, and, and this is also an important reason for the phenomenal growth of motor vehicles in peri-urban areas because suitable facilities for commutation are not available. And for this reason, people are left with no option but to purchase their own motor vehicle. Uh, and also one problem that is observed is about the, if a peri-urban area is situated between two cities like Guru Gram and Delhi, then motorists who are commuting on an everyday basis for going to residence or work, they use these areas as shortcuts. Uh, and which creates tremendous problems within these areas in terms of congestion and uh, air pollution. Uh, the government has not remained silent uh, on this front. It, it, this problem has been long recognized and uh, numerous efforts have been made from time to time to address the problems in peri-urban areas. In Delhi, for example, uh, 
the D Delhi Development Authority or the DDA's land pooling policy aims to ensure uh, planned development in peri-urban areas. Similarly, several metropolitan regions uh, have uh, made attempts to prepare special plans for such areas. At the state level, one can find uh, the case of Uttarakhand, where the government of Uttarakhand has initiated or launched a project to improve peri-urban residents' access to drinking water. This project is supported by the World Bank. And if you visit their website and uh, see, uh, you can find a number of schemes or projects, water supply projects, which are underway in the peri-urban areas of Roorkee, in uh, Dehradun, in Haldwani, in Haridwar, etc. Uh, similarly, uh, the government of Haryana has uh, it plans to introduce the concept of peri-urban agriculture, uh, which means that uh, in peri-urban areas, agriculture uh, uh, vegetables and uh, fruits will be grown uh, for supplying to nearby cities. At the national level, uh, uh, the metropolitan planning committees proposed under the 74th Constitution Amendment Act of the Government of India. Uh, these are required to, to look into the matters which are of common interest to municipalities and panchayats. And this includes uh, uh, preparing of special plans for, for these areas. Uh, similarly, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, the nodal ministry for uh, urban development in the country uh, it has asked the state governments to establish municipalities in uh, census towns which display urban characteristics but continue to be governed by panchayats. So by establishing municipalities in census towns, the idea of the ministry is that it will lead to improvement in the quality of life. Finally, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers' Welfare uh, has taken steps to increase food production and uh, diversification in peri-urban areas uh, so as to supply uh, this, uh, these commodities to nearby cities. So these are some of the policies and reforms uh, from the side of the government. Uh, to conclude, uh, I uh, can say that, uh, uh, and there is uh, consensus over the fact that India is going to experience further urbanization uh, and uh, the availability of land is going to reduce in cities in the times to come. And the pressure on peri-urban areas is expected to grow. Uh, the social, economic, environmental adversities that we see in many peri-urban areas are a reflection of the quality of planning and governance. And for this reason, there should not be any further delay in guiding future growth. Uh, to my mind, the four uh, suggestions come to mind when I think about this issue. The first one is to pursue the existing reforms, scale it up like the initiatives undertaken at the local, state, and national level. These need to be uh, implemented at the local level for achieving the transformation that everybody is looking for. So need to scale up existing reforms. The second point is about exploring rural-urban cooperation. When on one side, Indian cities are exploring cooperation between cities of other gov foreign governments, like there is a uh, agreement between Delhi and Fukuoka in Japan on different areas of cooperation have been identified, environment, uh, air quality, et cetera. So uh, why can't rural and urban local governments come together to address this issue of adversities in peri-urban areas. The third point is about statutory planning. In many of these areas or for many of these areas, a proper plan is not available still in most cases. And therefore there is a need to uh, prepare plans for these areas. And the final point is when one pr prepares plans, you have to go for detailed engineering. And this means uh, that uh, you need to address the issues related to aerial extent or administrative boundaries of uh, peri-urban areas. You have to do land monitoring, enforcement of provisions, laws, regulations, etc. You have to have data and prepare land use maps. And then uh, you have to have proper development controls, building, building bylaws, 
you have to have sufficient funds available to carry out uh, uh, the work of implementation of plans and also uh, have be equipped with uh, proper technologies. Uh, uh, and in my view, these are some of the most important reasons that are responsible for the occurrence of the problems that we see in peri urban areas today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rumi Azaz. I'm uh, thankful to you for uh, you have covered almost all the aspects in terms of typology for the first time. You brought about the issues in terms of census terms, slums, unauthorized, industrialization of the peri urban area, as well as residential colonies. And what is the contribution of uh, in migrants from the urban to the core area to the peripheral area? And you also discuss about the non planned and unplanned aspect of it, and also uh, low skilled employment and uh, how it is shifted out. And you also covered some of the aspects which um, uh, Chief Guest has mentioned about in terms of mobility, in terms of transportation, and increase in terms of vehicle pollution as well, which you mentioned about it. And you came out with example in terms of scaling what has to be done and rural urban linkages, state planning, and also detail. Now with this, you also mentioned about something of uh, groundwater, how it is being exploited there. To take that further, We'll shift to Dr. Shiraz Waji. Dr. Shiraz Waji is an ecologist by professional, and he has been uh, the president of this Gorakhpur Environmental Action Group, which is very, very famous across, not only within India, but also abroad, because he has been associated with the climate change or also with the environmental actions. And for 40 years, he has been doing on sustainable livelihood, urban resilience, natural resource management, disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and also in terms of livelihood uh, resilience. It's not only based in uh, Gorakhpur, but he has covered almost many major cities in India. And also in the uh, first, also in the secondary cities, also he covered many of these issues. I think we should hear from him because she, uh, but he has covered many aspects, even in terms of urban agriculture also, which he has done way back in uh, Gohati, okay, which I'm sure uh, by action, we have seen it also, how he has been doing in different places. And that action, whatever he has done in terms of ecologies, now I'm sure he will share it with us, both in terms of water and ecology and other issues in the peri-urban area. Over to Dr. Shiraz, please. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Professor Shridharan, and uh, giving us this opportunity to uh, talk and listen uh, at this very uh, important on this important issue, and uh, I would also like to congratulate you, uh, Professor Shridharan, in person, and also the team SPA for having continued this discussion, uh, networking deliberations around peri-urban issues for the last few years, and that has, of course, I mean that has helped. Uh, kind of networking as well as the changes in the policies and the programs uh, and I mean the whole recognition of the peri-urban spaces uh, in terms of its contribution uh, to uh, development and for the livelihood of the people. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to share a few points. I'll be brief. I don't have any uh, PowerPoint at this moment, uh, but would like to uh, point out some of the issues which uh, I think is important. And uh, one of the issue actually, which I mean, the main issue which I would like to emphasize uh, is the whole uh, ecological contribution of the peri-urban spaces. Uh, the peri-urban spaces in terms of uh, providing the resilience to the city and also the resilience to the people actually who are living there in the peri-urban spaces. Uh, in terms of the climate change impact, uh, the uh, disaster risk reduction, and also the increasing urbanization resilience and the carrying capacity of the cities are important. And both for the resilience and the carrying capacity of the city, uh, the peri-urban spaces play a major, major role. And that one has to recognize that uh, the, the ecological contribution of the peri-urban spaces is important. Uh, Professor Sridharan uh, was talking on uh, some of the cities and the earlier speaker also emphasized some of the cities. And while uh, doing some studies in like, I mean, what we have seen in Udaipur is that the kind of uh, stone mining, which is happening there uh, in the peri-urban spaces, in the hills, in the uh, Aravli hills, I mean, that has disrupted the whole microclimate of the city. And any uh, citizen of Udaipur can 
tell, I mean, how the things have changed uh, very uh, quickly in terms of the uh, microclimatic situation in the city. In Panjim, we have seen that how the, the intrusion of the peri-urban actually, I mean, that is contributing negatively to the saltwater intrusion in the city uh, and the groundwater. Gorakhpur, we have seen that how the forest, I mean, thinning of the forest around the city, that has put the city from a class three kind of hill station, which was, it was recognized to a, one of the warm city now, I mean, one of the hottest city uh, in North India. Uh, in Patna, we have seen how the peri-urban spaces in terms of rivers and the floodplains, the encroachment and the organized and unorganized, both kind of encroachments has created the problems in form of floods and waterlogging in Patna. So I mean, go to any city and you will find that the peri-urban spaces and the, eco the ecological role uh, which the peri-urban spaces have been uh, playing in terms of their hills, their uh, their forests, their rivers. Uh, I mean, that is contributing a lot in terms of providing the resilience and the, uh, the uh, sustainability to the city. Uh, one of the thing actually, which I would like to uh, point out here is that generally uh, we think of peri-urban spaces as something like a peri-urban land, a land which is uh, adjoining the city. But I mean, with these examples, I was also trying to emphasize that it is not only the land, it is the peri-urban hills or maybe the rivers or maybe the ocean, the forest, that plays an important role in the providing the resilience to the city in terms of uh, livelihood to the city. So it is not only the land and merely land use planning and the land use inputs will not help the sustainability of the cities. One has to think in a holistic way and recognize these peri-urban spaces as special ecological zones adjoining the city. And those special ecological zones will have to be protected, nurtured, conserved, and managed. So that is uh, something which is important. The second point uh, which I would like to highlight here is that peri-urban, we all know that it is a dynamic space and it keeps changing changes in terms of habitation pattern, changes in terms of occupational behaviors, ch it changes in various form in terms of density and so on. Uh, urban migration is also keeping at a I mean, very unprecedented rate. And the way uh, urbanization is happening, we are hoping that by, 19, uh, by 2060, almost 70% of the population in the world will be living in the urban areas. India is not different. And uh, we have seen that uh, this, the, this urban migration is now, I mean, more in secondary cities. Traditionally, it was Bombay, Delhi, Chennai, and uh, uh, the other mega cities where urban migrants were going. But now with the increased migration, uh, because, very, because of various reasons, agricultural deceleration, uh, less profitability in the agricultural, uh, agriculture based livelihood, the climate change impact, which is causing problems in agriculture and farming, the disaster impacts, the frequent disasters in form of floods or droughts, all these factors have contributed to increased urban migration. And these urban migration is happening more uh, in the areas which were largely dependent on agriculture. When you look at ex uh, example of Bihar, uh, in between the two uh, census in 10 years, the kind of urban migration which has happened is several hundred percent, almost 1100 percent. And all this uh, urban migration is happening in the secondary cities. So the, the, the secondary cities which have less capacity to deal with the changes, they are receiving more and more population and they are getting the peri-urban spaces disrupted. So the dynamic space, which is the peri-urban spaces, that actually has increased. And that is the problem, fast migration, means fast change in the peri-urban spaces also. And a city will have to have this ability to deal and maintain its ecological character of the peri-urban spaces because it provides the resilience and the carrying capacity to the city. Uh, and the secondary cities will have to be uh, ready and will have to prepare themselves for dealing with this kind of fast changes and maintaining this dynamic space, which is the peri-urban uh, areas. Uh, the next point which I would like to highlight here is that the peri-urban spaces, unfortunately, 
are generally treated as cities in waiting. And it is actually the place or the space which is prepared, nurtured, and developed uh, uh, through the uh, master plans, through the contractors, the land prices, and so on, as something actually which will become a city tomorrow. And not, I mean, the narrative will have to be that it is a crucial live ecological space rather than the cities which will it will become tomorrow. Maybe, I mean, it will become a city, but not a chaotic space, but as an organized ecologically sound space, which ultimately merges with the city. So that is also something which is important. And the policies uh, will have to see in this direction that we consider these peri urban spaces as something uh, which is the ecological, which has ecological contribution, it will have to be maintained. And the mechanisms uh, of maintaining its crucial ecological uh, viability will have to be thought of. Uh, the next issue uh, which I would like to highlight is that the peri urban spaces contributes in various ways. Some of the things uh, the earlier speaker was also mentioning the food, the livelihood, the supplies in terms of eggs, dairy, and all those vegetables, all these things are coming largely from the peri-urban spaces. So these are the tangible uh, kind of services which the peri-urban spaces are providing, not to its own citizens, but also to the urban people. And But th there are this whole range of intangible contribution of these uh, peri-urban spaces in terms of develop, I mean, providing the microclimate to the city, uh, in terms of providing the buffering capacity in the flood affected or the drought affected cities, in terms of ability of the city to manage and to deal with the shocks and stresses which the cities get, in terms of water recharge, in terms of recycling, all these things actually are the intangible contribution of these peri-urban spaces which are unnoticed in the uh, formal policies. That I mean, because of these reasons, these peri-urban spaces become a dumping ground, or I mean, the people living in the peri-urban spaces are at the receiving end. So one has to see that uh, these peri-urban spaces and their ecosystems, they provide nature-based solutions to the problem, and they also provide the livelihood to the people who are living there. Uh, in these wetlands, I mean, we were studying some of the cities where the wetlands have finished, and we saw that how the wetland uh, have been working as the kidney for landscape. Uh, I mean, they are the purifying, the, with the kind of recognition of the phytoremediation, the kind of recycling and uh, purification of the recycling of the uh, waste water, they perform the functions of the kidneys. And the, the, with the, with the uh, ignorance or the less priority for maintaining those wetlands, the problem of the city has grown and they are suffering, not only the people living in the peri-urban spaces, but also the people who are living in the city. So that will have to be recognized. Uh, when we talk of city or the urban area, we also talk of the poor people who are living there. And uh, when we talk of the poor people, then uh, their relationship or their linkage with the ecosystem services becomes quite close because Largely, the poor people have been surviving on the ecosystem services, support services, providing services, regulating services, even the cultural services. All these ecosystem services are contributing to the livelihood of the people who are poor. So one has to see that the urban poor will have to be addressed. And if we are thinking of the sustainability of the urban poor, we will have to see the sustainability of the ecosystem services also. So that linkage and the relationship of the poor people or less privileged people with the uh, with the uh, the ecosystem is quite close, and one will have to recognize that linkage of uh, helping the poor people to grow and to uh, uh, come out of the poverty. And in that term, uh, the uh, the ecosystem services are crucial and important. The last issue actually, which I would like to highlight here is also uh, that the peri-urban spaces will have to be seen as integral component of the urban area. And it has not to be seen as a different from urban because generally uh, the, in, in all the governance mechanisms, the cities generally are treated as something 
which is within the municipal boundary. So the cities are beyond the cities, the, the municipal boundary also. And one will have to see that the governance actually that recognizes the integration of the peri-urban and the urban spaces so that it becomes kind of integral component and the peri-urban spaces are in alignment with the urban areas. And that actually becomes the kind of a continued uh, uh, kind of system uh, in terms of flow of services, goods, and so on. So uh, in governance also, one will have to see that how these two things can be clubbed together. With this, I would like to end here. Uh, thank you so much. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to respond. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shiraz. I'm uh, quite happy to point out some of the things which you talk about a new internet uh, narratives and different dimensions in terms of uh, resilience, climate change, urbanization. And you talked about that uh, four case studies in terms of Udaipur, Panjim, Gorakhpur, and Patna. And for the first time, you also mentioned about ecological zone. It's not only about land, but also about water, forest, agriculture, and also land use planning in terms of not a small way, but a big way how we can do that. But you also pointed out certain issue in terms of how this uh, water recharge and wetland and recycling has been done, and also with the food and livelihood, how it is associated with that. But most important contribution, which can continue with this further, you gave a case study of Bihar, what you talked about the secondary cities, how it can be. Uh, you know, what kind of problem existed from that of the core to the uh, dynamic people in terms of the secondary cities. To talk something more about the dynamic portion, as well as about the secondary cities, we invite Dr. Boneshwari Raman. Dr. Boneshwari Raman is trained in architecture and urban planning. Uh, she has worked with the uh, Asian Institute of Technology for some time. And also she contributed quite a lot with the uh, LSE, that is London School of Economics, where he, completed a doctorate also in urban social policy. And uh, she has contributed a lot in terms of transformation of land in small towns and uh, large urbanizing villages, especially in India across with the uh, French government and also with the, uh, did a lot of thing in terms of new technologies in spatial governance, because it's a very peculiar thing where he combined all the, uh, she has combined all these things, okay. She has also discussed something about in terms of uh, along with the London, uh, London School of Economics, she has done work in terms of squatter location policies, both with the core and the periphery, both in the case of uh, Chennai as well as in Bangalore. I mean, without giving much uh, space for her, I mean, I would request uh, Dr. Boneshwari to continue with this program and that to focusing on secondary cities, how it is uh, she has been working on it and what contributions we can do in terms of peri-urban spaces. Over to Dr. Boneshri Raman, please. Thank you, Professor Sridhar. I hope you are able to see my screen. Yeah, yeah, make it in a... Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to uh, lay down the broad arguments, some of which it builds on Ija, uh, Rumi Ija's speech and uh, Professor Shiraj Vadsi's uh, speech, which happened later. Um, the context of this, as I was preparing this presentation, what struck me was the Chennai floods of 2021. That is in the last week of December, Chennai witnessed unprecedented downpour. And this was partly due to the uh, changes in the rainfall pattern, but the uh, but there were also certain human uh, in, human contribution to the why and how this flood occurred. This entire while the entire city was flooded, the outskirts were affected disproportionately. This followed a publication of a report on flooding in some pre, prior to it. There was a because the 2015 floods was very much in the memory of the citizens, and that led to the publication of a report on flooding in September 2020 with the new government, which uh, vouches for social justice, taking office. The report itself talked about the regular things in terms of uh, encroachment, illegal occupation, need for restoration of river and water. And uh, the already marginalized groups were portrayed as culprits in this narrative. Again, okay, certain residential locations were targeted, particularly post-2021 uh, floods for uh, removal. Yeah, And this conflict is still going on. Having said this, what I want to argue in this case is that um, 
the peri-urban uh, landscape, as Rumi, I just was arguing, is a mosaic of different uh, settlements. You have these uh, high end, as my images that I portrayed in down in the other slides, you have these townships and luxury apartments juxtaposing with these old villages, which is with devoid of any, any infrastructure. These are also spaces where you find the Korean township jostling with the squatter settlements very next to it or the old villages looking, uh, earning for the same level of infrastructure that one can find in the Korean townships, yeah. And um, these are spaces where you also find resettlement colonies. So the peri-urban space, if you take of any city, is not a homogeneous space. It's a very heterogeneous territory in terms of both its socio uh, socioeconomic groups that inhabit it, the types of occupational pattern, and particularly the ecological features that is uh, intrinsic to it. Now, as uh, Shiraz Vajra pointed out, one of the issues that the flooding, the flooding brought to core, and perhaps a question that it raised in Chennai is that, how do we look at planning? How do we understand planning? And how do we understand peri-urban transformation? I am also a uh, culprit of it. Every time we think about urban transformation, we premise land. Whereas what it comes to it is we need to think of it as a territory, territory with ecological feature. Land is not a terra nullae, which seems to be the case with a lot of our planning approach, both in academia and in policy, right? And the second issue is connected to it is that how do we think of land and water as a connected system? Because at the moment, if you look at the way uh, one of the reasons for this flood that happened in Chennai is obviously the uh, appropriation of lakes and uh, appropriation of lakes and uh, rivulets and the natural drainage courses that led the water from many parts of the city into the Bay of Bengal and which was um, kind of cut off because of the various forms of development that came in. Okay, Now we talk about encroachment, but what are these nature of encroachment and who drove this encroachment? What are the forces that drive it? Okay, Because every time we think about encroachment, we always think about the poor, the squatter settlements and the irregular colonies. But if you look at the stories of peri-urban development in different parts of uh, Chennai, Bangalore's outskirts, and also the Sonipat, particularly along the Grand Trunk Road, one of the things that comes to fore, a main question that comes to pose is, who really governs the peri-urban areas? Who drives the urban regulate, uh, land, regu land and water regulation? And who drives urban a... development? Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. Don't this link, uh, yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, who drives it? Because we, we often talk about the state, we often talk about the master plan, but if you really look at each of these case studies, there have been two, three agencies, which are several agencies of which two are very prominent. One is your industrial development corporation, whether it's Chennai or Karnataka, or Sri Parambadur, which is a small town just outside, it, outside the Chennai's area, Chennai metropolis. Or if you take the Sonipat area, it's again the Haryana Urban Industrial Development Corporation and the Kuda Urban Development Authority. Both of them have been spurring different types of projects. In addition, you also have various kinds of corridor-led projects. So what we have is not a coordinated plan that writes the transformation, but you have a series of projects and you have a series of actors who are coming in. And each of these actors, as the cases, uh, as the, I may not be able to go through the, the presentation, but I'm willing, uh, but the presentation is available for uh, this thing, and I'm willing to, happy to share the papers related to it. If you look at who are the main actors that are involved to it, one of the key actors are the Urban Development Authority and Industrial Development Corporation themselves, who strategies of urban land transformation, particularly under the PPP, perpetuates large scale township development where the developers, large developers become the key ally. Now the land market is shaped in such a way which came out very much in the Sri Paramadur case, your small developers, your private developers and the so-called colonizers pretty much acted as brokers for these large developers. Okay, and whether it is the private colonies or the large townships, the question of uncoordinated infrastructure remained there. 
So the second question, and I think uh, we need to think about is the role of the state in the way it is governing natural resources. Yeah, and um, the primary thing which many scholars have pointed out is this valorization of land, okay? Valorization of land that is ecologically sensitive and that continues even today, even though we talk about it, even though it is recognized in the planning, land-based financing seems to be the key strategy for many development authorities and that perpetuates a dynamic where land is just seen as a, as a source of finance. It's not seen as an ecological features, and that is something that requires change in mindset and approach both at the level of policy and academia and the way we approach land. Yeah. Um, uh, we have, if you look at the, uh, I'm gonna skip these slides because these are on uh, theory. If you look at the urban land transformation, peri-urban transformation, there's an extensive scholarship that is available on peri-urban transformation, which is predominantly highlighted the ways in which state has um, accelerated land development in a very predatory way and the ways in which it has um, particularly benefited large developers and, the, uh, and their allies and marginalized vulnerable groups. Now, what this is an issue, this is a story that you hear in several cities. Um, but the question, particularly what we need to think about is that there are two aspects. One is the socio-political aspects or the ways in which peri-urban transformation is being governed. And the other is the ecological effects and the ways in which it is differently felt in different parts of the city. And if you talk about the socio-political uh, effects, in places like Tamil Nadu, caste becomes a key question. It is the people who were already disadvantaged, who were supposed to be benefited by land reforms, necessarily did not get benefited when this large developer-led development took place. And this is uh, this is something you. It depends on the land holding, and particularly in places like Sri Perambur and Bangalore, many of them are small farmers or farmers who were under tenancy. So they are not farmers who had um, uh, who had uh, enough wealth to fall back on. Once you take the land and you are taking the land, you need to understand this appropriation of the land in the context of either the large developer or the state-led acquisition. The bargaining power is very less. Then it's not true that compensation really compensates the livelihood. And for many of them, it becomes a key question of how do they deal with their livelihood. And this story remains in the three, uh, three peripheries that I uh, studied in the context over the years. Now, the second thing is when we talk about land, when we talk about land as a terra nullae, now what has happened in, what is common to all these places is that land and the cultivation, common land, water bodies, all of them have been appropriated. You have three minutes. Sorry? Three minutes you have. Okay. Uh, appropriated for land, um, uh, appropriated for real estate development. So what is the impact of this kind of thing? Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to the last slide where I show the Chennai's ecological development. These are slides which shows of the patterns of land development in different cities. And if you look at Chennai's case, for example, Chennai's, in terms of Chennai, if you think of the periphery, Chennai's periphery, as I said, are very different. One of it is the coastal area, okay? And Chennai is also, um, Chennai is also a city that is facing coastal, um, facing imminent inundation because of the sea level rise. And the other is the inland city, like Sri Parambadur, where these industrial corridors are being planned. So both of them are ecologically very different areas. But along these areas, you have large infrastructure projects that are being planned and which has led to indiscriminate development of touristic, uh, touristic hotels or luxury hotels or townships. Now, the effect of it kind of varies. It's both, and particularly one of the reasons why flooding remains in, Bank, in Chennai is because of the ways in which our estuaries and uh, bonds have been uh, talked about, uh, have been uh, polluted. Particularly uh, in one of the World Bank meeting, it is now we have come to a situation to accept, well, Chennai has lost its mangrove roads. It's lost its wetland, okay? Its estuary is silted. 
and therefore it um, the mouth is silted so often we have the sea water coming back flowing into the river right so the question is the question we have reached a situation where in a world bank meeting the discussion was about how do we now keep the water to storm water drainage rather than getting it drained we because flooding it's more or less accepted that flooding is going to remain now rather than seeing how to plan how do we plan to avoid flooding we have reached a situation well we have to live with it and let's see other uh, other stop gap solutions to deal with the situation i think uh, chennai's case is a key lesson to look at again how do we rethink about the ways in which we are uh, planning our natural resources how in uh, the ways in which we are governing organization and in this process how are we drawing the natural resources for our governance okay that is in terms of ecological thing and the second key lesson is each city the while the forces that is driving land transformation and the role of the state and the various institutions one can find similarities in it the effects of it differ and therefore there is a need for much more fine grained ethnographic studies to understand this process thirdly is the question of um, uh the thirdly is the question of uh, how do you deal with the socio political consequences of that uh, professor shiraz work talked about migration yes yes it's true migration drives the uh, growth of suburban areas but who are these migrants and which type of migrants are uh, entering spaces like shri parambadu the korean international immigrant is very different from your know, orian uh, um, factory worker who lives in shifts within a 5 by 8 houses and there are certain con- conflicts that comes around it and which has never gets addressed so whilst a lot of the things that rumia just spoke about like housing is an issue but what kind of housing are you planning is it all housing about luxury housing and gated township or can any land and water system be drawn in for housing or are you are we thinking about housing to accommodate heterogeneous set of population i end this thing in the interest of time in terms of how do we think about reconciling reconciling the psychological social and political goals in the way we plan do we need to rethink what we how we understand plan and planning and also uh, do we need to rethink about the fract- governance the ways in which we are governing a uh, area like particularly in the chennai case when these conflicts came out the what came out is this contradictory role of the revenue department the planning department and the infrastructure provisioning how do you reconcile it in all of these where is the master plan should we even think of master plan or should we move ahead and think of better strategies to govern or uh, to ecologically to incorporate ecological thinking in the way we are governing urbanization thank you thank you very much uh, dr raman a uh, good aspects you covered with many aspects of uh, dimension in from the chennai bangalore and also with sonipet from the residential to industry to the various conflict that comes in terms of wetland estuaries and lost in the wetland and how this whole aspect to take it further it does have that many aspects which you talked about social political and ecological sensitivities and also in terms of vulnerable groups and you also covered in terms of governance structure that is uh, saskia sasan has brought about long back okay now to consider all these aspects how what impact it has got in terms of the health issues and other issues related to water and other dimension we bring dr um, kasten bush who has been working in the field of uh, medical and health geography and he has been working in india for the past 16 years and in fact he was self associated with for so many years from 2004 onwards and he will be talking something in terms of urbanization how it has covered in terms of urban health urban risk and also in peri urban areas because it started with peri in terms of uh, pune mumbai and also in hyderabad and delhi in all the places over to dr kasten he is with the university of cologne and also with the university of bonn he has been working as a interim professor there in university of bonn over to dr kasten please yes thank you sri <clears throat> i'm doing this presentation together with uh, dr okay. hamdan uh, okay 
I also to introduce uh, Dr. Leon also. He is with the Associate Professor with the Water Policy at Dell University of Technology. So both of them together. And in fact, Dr. Uh, Leon is working in terms of actor and strategy models. He has come out with a paper and a book also on this in 2010. So it's a good idea to combine both of them in terms of land and water management. And over to both of them, please, Dr. Karsten and Leon. Yes, thank you, Sri. We will be sharing this presentation, so I will start and uh, I will do a little bit more the descriptive part and we'll talk about a project on which we have been working on the last three, in the last three years. And there are other presentations in this conference uh, by Freya Chakrabotti in the gender session, by Zara Luft in the water session, and uh, by Charlene Bombs in the um, session on governance, if you are further interested in the findings. So uh, a lot of things have been said already about the peri-urban, so I'll just still give a very brief um, our understanding of what is the peri-urban space. Um, in a paper, we defined peri-urban spaces in the global south, and I think that is one thing which is very unique and which we cannot underestimate. Peri-urbanization is a process and a theory which emerged from the global south. Uh, and I think it's really under, very important. If you look at urbanization in the global south, we need to come up with these new theories, which are informed by empirical evidence. We must not talk about um, postmodern urban development and stuff like that. Um, issues and theories which were brought up by scholars from the global north, but I think it's really important to come up with unique theories. And I think peri-urbanization at the peri-urban is one of these theories. So peri-urban spaces in the global south are, from our understanding, spaces of flows. And at the same time, they're fluid spaces. So they're, as uh, the second speaker already said, their future is not yet determined. So they're spaces of flows where the rural and the urban meet and exchange and that are characterized by a mix of urban and rural features resulting in a mosaic of land uses. And I think this is very specific that we have, as you see in this illustration, which we draw, uh, that you have very urbanized centers we spoke about, and that was nicely illustrated also by the first um, speaker. We have, uh, on the one hand, informal settlements, uh, but we also have these townships coming up and stuff like that. So we have this mix of land uses, this mosaic. And that is also very interesting. We have a multiplicity of stakeholders, sometimes with diverging interests, and in many cases, weak governance structures and overlaying different governance structures, which are traditional governance structures, new governance structures coming in. And I think this is the most important thing, which actually makes this transformation interesting, but also um, challenging. So in our project, we had two phases, and I will briefly summarize the first phase, while uh, Leon will summarize the second phase. In the first phase, we actually had three perspectives on the peri-urban transformation, uh, which were evolving around water. The first perspective, and that was covered by uh, Leon Hermans and uh, Shalene Gomez, who work on institutions and changing governance arrangements in the peri-urban regarding water. The second perspective, by Shreya Chakraborty from Saki Waters in Hyderabad. She looked at uh, how is access to water as a consumption good changing in peri-urban areas. And the perspective that was covered by Zara Luft and me from University of Cologne, we looked at livelihood changes related to water in the process of peri-urbanization. And that was to analyze how water and, uh, is changing in the peri-urban areas. And in the second phase, we wanted to look into the future and we asked the question, what are potential alternative transformation pathways to help promote a more sustainable development of peri-urban areas? We have been working in three agglomerations across India, which are in different states. So they have different governance setups and which have a different availability of water. We have been working together there with local partners. Sometimes we have been working together with Bahati Vidya Peet University in Pune. We have been working in uh, Hyderabad, where Saki Waters and JNU uh, were the partners, and in Kolkata, where TU Delft was the leading partner, and we had as local partner the researcher. So um, I would like to briefly introduce you to, in, in those three areas, we had two villages. So in total, we have been working in six <laughs> peri urban villages, <laughs> uh, quite, um, which had quite different pathways of development. 
And um, I would just like to introduce two of these villages to you. One is situated in the Western Ghats, that's called Paut. It's uh, west of Pune. It has a very high rainfall. And what you can see is actually uh, on these two pictures. One is the, um, the view on the old village. And then would, if you would turn around 180 degrees, you would see up this township, new township, which is coming up. And which, of course, will lead to some uh, problems regarding water availability when it comes, for example, to drinking water. And the second one is related to what uh, to this kidneys, as our second speakers told it. It's uh, situated in Kolkata, in the East Kolkata wetlands, which actually uh, filter the water, but where also livelihoods are created from that. For the analysis of the changes which are going on, we applied the um, framework of the um, hydrosocial cycle. Uh, which was developed in the um, since the, the 1990s, uh, first with the seminal term which was introduced by Eric Swingenu on the waterscape. And what is actually the defining term is that the hydrosocial cycle is looking at the connections between society and the landscape and how they're influencing each other. So that was our um, uh, well, our analytical perspective, which is heavily informed by political ecology. Um, just to briefly show you these two case studies and what we have seen, of course, I could talk about each of the case studies for an hour, but I'll do it just in two minutes. Um, so when we look at the hydrosocial cycles in Paut, a very water-rich uh, village in the um, Western Ghats, we actually see that the hydrosocial cycle has been changed um, as dams were built in the Western Ghats. Uh, what we also see there is that these dams, which are multi-purpose dams, we see, for example, changing rights. There are traditional fishing communities which have been in, or which are increasingly restricted from the access of water. But on the other hand, we see a better access, for example, for farmers. We see a lot of uh, water-based livelihoods changing. For example, for the agriculture, we see something that is reported also in areas, which is either intensify or drop out. And uh, we see new water-based livelihoods coming up here, which are related to the process of periurbanization. When we look at water as a consumption good, we see that there is a very good supply of water there, uh, which is organized by the panchayat, but which is under stress because of the um, growth and which is related to what you see here in the background uh, to this new township, which is coming up because all of a sudden uh, they have to cater for uh, a population twice as large as it was in the past. When we look at this peri-urban village in the East Kolkata wetlands, actually this is a completely or mostly man-made uh, environment because um, the wastewater of Kolkata has been since colonial times led to this area and a lot of livelihoods, for example, uh, aquaculture is based on that. Um, this has been restructured heavily by the government because that was all in the hand of Zamindas and has been uh, transferred into smaller uh, cooperatives and uh, private land holding. Um, so we see a lot of changes in the water-based livelihoods at the moment. Uh, aquacultures are becoming more predominant. And in the agricultures, we see some subsistence farming or intensification. And intensification usually means shifting to agriculture. Um, regarding water of a, as a consumption good, we actually see a very mixed um, sources. People have their own ponds, have pumps, but also buy RO water. And this RO, reverse of Moses water plants, this is actually developing as a new livelihood. So um, the findings for all of the six village actually show that we fundamental uh, see fundamental differences in the development pathways of these six villages. And I think this is one of the interesting findings, which is also important for our conference. Uh, the pathways of peri-urban villages are really very different. Um, when we look at the hydrosocial cycles, we see a lot of institutional changes which affect the waterscape very fundamentally. So we actually have man-made waterscapes around the cities. There's not much natural there left anymore. We see uh, a changing water, uh, a changing relations of the water and society. And one thing which is very important is the commodification of the resource. Um, when we look at the water-based livelihoods, we see um, in agriculture, basically an intensification or people are giving up 
We see new water-based livelihoods, so the pressure on the resource is also uh, rising. And um, yeah, we see new markets which come up. And when we look at the at water as a consumption good, we see that um, the perception of drinking water is changing fundamentally. It has to be healthy. It has to be pure. We see an increase in almost all of the villages in RO plants, which also goes hand in hand with the commodification. And somewhat pipe water is seen as an ideal. And with that, I hand over to Leon. Yeah, thank you. Karsten, so then um, I, I will uh, try to uh, to share the, the second um, part of, of our project, and that was based on this analysis of these of these waterscapes and of these uh, dynamics in these peri-urban uh, sites that, that we have been studying in our research project. Um, the obvious next question is, okay, so can we do something to proactively plan um, these future transformations as we see them ongoing in these peri-urban areas. And um, you will understand from, from the explanations and the descriptions given by, by Karsten, but also obviously from, from the earlier speakers, that this planning is, 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 is not um, um, a small challenge. Um, in fact, you could question if, if just the conventional master planning, um, I think that was also what, what Dr. Rahman uh, ended up with within her presentation. Can, can we stick to conventional master planning, knowing that we have to include all these various aspects, including the, the ecological and the intangible um, contributions that peri-urban areas make? And uh, in the reality of currently uncoordinated um, and unregulated development, including multiple stakeholders and still having the open question of, um, yeah, who drives this, this development? So whereas we have this sort of classical notion of, of we, we develop a plan from going from situation A to, to a situation B, maybe a current situation that, that we would like to improve to, to a future a situation that is much more sustainable. Um, we adopted in our project a, a slightly different approach to planning, and maybe Karsten can uh, put up the next slide, and that is to, to realize that, in fact, um, um, linear planning, master planning, is, is, is no longer um, the appropriate sort of approach for these kind of com complex systems and complex peri-urban areas. And we were looking and are looking, I think, all, all of us for, for new approaches that help us guide planning. And one of these approaches is, is um, yeah, depicted here is, is, is adaptation pathways. It is the realization that we do want to plan. We, do, we don't want to leave this development fully unguided. At the same time, we also know we can't plan a linear pathway from, from A to B from now into 2030 or 2040. We have to anticipate um, uh, changes, unknown changes sometimes, and um, influences from stakeholders, from developments, from sectors that at this point in time, we cannot uh, predict uh, and fully foresee. Um, so we, we try to elaborate an adaptive planning approach based on adaptation pathways. Yes, thank you, Karsten. And we took an existing um, methodology as a basis, an existing uh, ad adaptation pathways planning uh, methodology that was uh, developed for um, actually for adaptive delta planning in the context of climate change, but that we thought this could also fit the peri-urban um, transformation planning. What you see on this slide is, is um, a, a schematic uh, pathways planning map. And I just want to highlight the main elements on this, on this map uh, for you. On, on the left side, we see conventional actions. Think of these as, as the policy strategies or the policy actions that, that we could consider. And that is very much as, as in conventional, let's say, master planning. On the right-hand side, fully right-hand side, we do see that, that we do want to consider the various costs and benefits of our pathways. So think of the, the planning goals, uh, maybe a multi-criteria analysis kind of, of things, the, the, the values that we care about. And these could be economic and, and financial uh, costs and benefits, but they should, in the peri-urban areas, of course, also include the um, ecological values and benefits, social costs and benefits, and other 
other ways that, that we can uh, use to sort of capture these, these intangible features as part of our planning objectives. I think this is also part of, of conventional master planning that hopefully you are familiar with. But what is the part in the middle is, is what makes this a dynamic uh, adaptation pathway. What you see here is, is, is depicted different possible pathways consisting of possible different possible sequences of actions and strategies. And we know that at some point in time, maybe we hit a development um, uh, that causes um, a certain strategy to reach a natural end. Maybe we can continue business as, as usual, um, continue with, with combined agriculture activities and with, with including um, urban migration up to a certain point until we may hit um, um, a tipping point, a terminal, and we really need to transfer to another pathways to, to carry us further into the future. And of course, we, we can do all of this reactively, but we can also think about these things proactively. And that, that would help you to think about what are the possible pathways, what are the possible scenarios that we already now want to consider, including maybe um, the signposts and the triggers, the, 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 the signals that, that we can identify that would tell us that we would need to start considering another pathway for a more sustainable future. Finally, what you see at, at the bottom of, of, this, of this graph is, is, is a timeline. And what is important to know for this particular um, planning approach is that the timeline, obviously it, it, it's time. So ultimately we can put uh, years on there. Um, but in pathways planning, what is more important than saying this happens over 10 years is to, to realize these are the kind of developments, maybe migration, maybe um, the, the availability of certain wetland uh, functions, maybe uh, urban, urban growth and expansion or population numbers, maybe rainfall patterns and climate change. The, these are signals that we, we know that they can happen, but we don't know if they happen over five years or over 15 years. So the year axis is actually sort of flexible and much more important is to, to think about the signals that tell us that we would need to change. Um, now to implement this, we, we go to the next slide because we did want to do this in a, in a participatory fashion because we realize we have all these uncertainties, these, these aspects that, that we want to integrate that makes the future so uncertain that we want a, a dynamic planning approach, but we also have all these stakeholders. So we also are looking for a participatory uh, planning approach. And what we used was um, um, a participatory ap approach based on um, a classic uh, Delphi analysis, which is a planning method that was traditionally used um, to, to actually uh, forecast the influence of, te of technology uh, more than, uh, more than uh, uh, several decades ago, but which can also be used for other participatory planning processes, especially if you do them in a sequence of rounds when you involve your stakeholders uh, over different rounds. So it's not just one, um, one event in which we bring stakeholders together, but it's a sequence of events. And what was the benefit of this Delphi approach for us as a project team working over uh, COVID times is that Delphi also allows for uh, asynchronous uh, parallel inputs from the various stakeholders. So it's actually relies for an important part on questionnaires and, and interviews with the individual stakeholders, which we then analyze and collect over various rounds um, to, to come up with a convergence and to build the pathways uh, that we wanted to build. And we designed this um, based on the research results that, that we had, that, that Karsten shared. And based on that, uh, we designed the questionnaires, uh, mostly with the local stakeholders in the communities, in the three sites that Karsten uh, discussed. So in, in Kolkata, near Hyderabad and uh, near Pune. But in parallel, um, we also did a, a Delphi approach with experts, um, which, which is a quite different exercise. But of course, it's also interesting to see across peri-urban sites, what are the futures that uh, different experts from different disciplinary backgrounds see for peri-urban areas in India more 
in general. Um, we finished this, this this Delphi approach uh, mostly for some of our village sites with the with the community stakeholders. Um, and on the next slide is one example. I, I, it, it is not my intention to, to go over the details with you, but I just wanted to give you one 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 example of a picture. Um, but the details of what we have been doing and the results that we have been obtaining. Um, will be shared with you in other presentations in the uh, parallel sessions by, by other researchers in our uh, H2O T2S project. And this particular uh, figure uh, will be uh, covered also by Charlene Gomez in her uh, presentation tomorrow in the governance and infrastructure session. So with this, I think we come to, to the conclusion of our joint presentation. So let me just uh, summarize and, and re remind you of, of, of our main insights. Um, we have been focusing especially on, on the water um, dimension in peri-urbanization, and we have seen that the relation between water and society undergoes a fundamental change, but also a change that can be quite differently for different peri-urban villages, depending on their uh, locations and characteristics and, and starting points. It does put a lot of pressure on this resource and that is very similar to what we have heard from other speakers about pressures on ecological uh, uh, resources uh, more generally. Um, the governance, the multiplicity of stakeholders, but definitely also of the governance structures uh, does affect the access to water and uh, um, influences the options we have for development. Um, with these insights, we have been trying to, to, to develop uh, a new sort of planning approach. And we think that this approach does hold promise for yeah, planned transformations, but not fully controlled transformations. Um, um, what we have observed in using this approach is that with peri-urban communities, so the more the local stakeholders, is that even they uh, at the local level do have agency, meaning that they do have an influence and a, um, a certain degree of, of control over their futures. Um, it is limited, of course, because they are dependent on also a lot of the developments and, and activities of the other stakeholders outside their, their, their village community, but it is not insignificant. And I think the future challenge that, that we see one of the future challenges is really to, to take this pathways planning approach, um, the participation and the coordination in there further beyond just one uh, level or scale of stakeholders to include also the other levels where, where we have the stakeholders and where we have the governance agencies. So not just the local level, but also the regional levels, the state levels, and, and ultimately even also the national level uh, planners. With that, um, maybe we can show the final slide to, to, to acknowledge everyone in our project team um, and our partners in, in Pune and Kolkata as well. Um, so thank you uh, for, uh, for hearing us out. Thank you, Dr. Carson, and as well as Dr. Leon. And you give a different dimension of a coming approach in terms of path approach. Uh, if uh, Dr. Surinder Bagne is there. Okay, I just want to summarize the whole thing and also give a different dimension of that whole. Um, first, let me thank um, Dr. Surinder Kumar Bagne, the additional secretary in the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Dr. Rumi, Dr. Shiraz. Dr. Boneshwari, Dr. Karsten, and Dr. Leon. Thank you very much for approaching the whole thing from a different, different dimensions, the multidimensional approach, and also in terms of different scales, you discussed about some of the issues. But I just want to point out some of the things so that we can discuss at the last uh, session also on these aspects. You have covered many aspects in terms of, especially the Karsten and Leon talked about the S2OT2S, from the dynamic to fluid spaces, how it is happening in urban and rural. And also you discuss about hydrosocial cycle and institutional changes related to water. And you also discuss about the water dimension, society and ecological and government structure as well. So here, I would like to pinpoint out some of the new developments which is happening in India. Uh, probably with, uh, it's good for all the uh, participants to know about it. Niti Aayog has come out in 2020, certain issues in terms of governance, urban governance, urban planning. 
which includes in terms of peri urban area and hill areas as well not only within the hill area uh, within the urban but also beyond that in terms of peri urban context that is something which is new they came out with a dimension a different dimension even in terms of capacity building at various levels and uh, it's available in the niti ayog uh, site the next dimension which is coming up which is going to be uh, released day after tomorrow on 20th it was supposed to be today morning because the ministry is uh, not but the minister is not well so it's going to release it which is called as uh, rural area planning formulation and development it is focused in terms of uh, rural spatial planning and linking it in terms of what is called as gram panchayat in terms of various dimension in terms of finance and fiscal and every aspect of it so this is the first time we are focusing in terms of peri urban areas focusing on the different dimensions of from somewhere around 1 lakh population uh, sorry 100000 population of a rural area to that of which is peripheral areas which peri urban areas is going to be released in, in day after tomorrow i can give the links to some of you also the next point is that in 2021 census town has come out with a new dimension anything above 4000 population and beyond even 4000 15000 and all for the first time they are including all the villages which are more than 4000 50000 10000 plus they are thinking in terms of using it as an urban area so that some of them can be brought in as a urban context in terms of urban planning Okay, that is something a new dimension which is under the Census Act, which not many people may know about this. Now, in terms of land transformation in the rural area, especially in the peri-urban areas of national highway, state highway, and district highways, the rural development, uh, the Ministry of Panchayati Raj has come out with a new program called Swamitva, which came up in just in uh, January two thousand twenty-one, uh, December two thousand twenty. the swamitva talks about digitalization of that uh, village habitats and what kind of infrastructure to be provided and more so in the peri urban area they are concentrating first on these so which are already started in metro, uh, many of the metro uh, the metropolitan peri urban areas they are already started implementation of that in terms of infrastructure in terms of land use planning and all these are all the things which we can discuss about it and also try to see what is uh, talked about dr leon in terms of the hybrid delhi approach which he talks about it and also the various adaptation uh, pathways which we can think about it in terms of time factor because the niti ayog also being very keen in terms of coming out with in terms of the master plan not for 20 years but in terms of how to have that uh, evaluation done every 5 uh, years because the dynamic aspect which is happening in the peri urban areas is fast so now the government is thinking in terms of not coming out with that of a master plan but in terms of master plan with sub sub plans which can come in terms of phasing of that whole thing okay Th these are all the new dimensions which are coming up in the government of india uh, probably we need to uh, link ourselves to these some of these aspects which they focus in terms of ecological especially because i am sure we must have Uh, seen some of the things in terms of sdgs which is happening across india and at city level and beyond the city level in terms of sdgs niti ayog has come out with a plan and also with a report on this so how they think in terms of especially sdg 6 and also in terms of land and other aspects including ground water okay these are all the different dimension which is emerging in india and uh, we have to update ourselves in all these dimensions and also suggest them in terms of ecological zones how it is required in terms of peri urban areas i think we uh, still we can discuss about it in the uh, last session on this and uh, thank you once again to dr surendra kumar bagre dr rumi azas dr shiras dr boneshwari dr kasten and dr leon for contributing a very very important aspects and different dimensions of it also covering many cities from pune to hyderabad to kolkata to gorakhpur to the different dimension to bihar so we have a chennai bangalore and different dimensions so the thank you very much once again for this and enriching our whole conference to this effect thank you any close now yeah. we announce uh, the next session starts at 4 o'clock uh, please join us thank you